Welcome to The Joys of Binge Reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We interview successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never be without a book you can't put down. You'll find this episode's show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. And now, here's our show. How did first-time author C.F. Yetman achieve the beginner writer's dream and have a Hollywood power broker like George Clooney promote her first book? Hi there, I'm your host Jenny Wheeler and today C.F. talks about the amazing convergence that saw her first Anna Klein book ride a tidal wave of publicity on the crest of a Clooney blockbuster. But before we talk to C.F., just a reminder that the show notes for this binge reading episode can be found at the website thejoysofbingereading.com. That's where you'll find a full transcript of our discussion, plus links to CF's books and website, as well as details about how to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. But now, here's CF. Hello there, CF. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us from Austin, Texas. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to, to know that we can connect over the oceans. Look, beginning right at the beginning, was there a once a time upon a time moment when you realized that you had to write fiction or somehow your life would be the poorer for it? And if so, what was the catalyst? You know, I don't know if there was a particular moment. I was a big reader as a child. I loved reading books. Uh, I grew up speaking German uh, and I learned English when I was about six. So I read books in both languages. Um, and I have always enjoyed reading. And then I began writing. And I remember, uh, you know, in about seventh or sixth or seventh grade, I wrote a long. Uh, a long story that won some kind of award, as I remember. And I thought, oh, this is fun. Uh, and um, I've I've just always enjoyed it. When I uh, went to college, I studied English. Um, but my professional career really uh, involved working with writers. I worked in book publishing and magazine publishing, but I wasn't writing myself until um, much later in my life. Uh, so I think it was always out there in my mind. I didn't think that it was a feasible or realistic dream. But uh, I think uh, when my daughter was born, um, you know, you start keeping odd hours and, <laughs> and you find things to do in the middle of the night. So uh, that was when I started writing and, and uh, really began enjoying doing that. And those first attempts, were they in this historical mystery genre? Um. Well, I, you know, that the, the first book, The Roses Underneath, is the first thing that I wrote. So, and it, it took me five years. So, yes, the first attempts were really terrible attempts at uh, historical fiction. Uh, it took me a while to get my legs under me. Yes, yes, yeah. And that first book, The Roses Underneath, it's the first in your Anna Klein trilogy, for those who are not so familiar with your work. Um, it deals with a topic which did become quite high profile, quite a while after you obviously started writing about it. There have now been two movies set around it at least, and that's the restoration of stolen art in Nazi Germany. Now, The Monuments Men with George Clooney and Matt Damon came out in 2014, but you obviously had started writing long before that because I think The Roses Underneath also did come out in 2014, didn't it? It did. It came out three weeks before the movie came out, and that was... Uh uh, a long uh, effort in the making. I had started writing the book in 2009 uh, when I had come across a documentary on television uh, called The Rape of Europa, which is also based on a book. Uh, and it uh, uh, presented the work of the Monuments Men, which I knew nothing about, even though I was kind of a World War II uh, buff. I was, I've was. i always been interested in World War II, uh, but I didn't know anything about this particular uh, army unit. Uh, and it really resonated with me because my day job is writing about architecture. And so my clients are all architects and many of the monuments men themselves were architects. And so I really became interested in their work and um, found um, 
more material. Uh, and somehow I think I plugged into some kind of cosmic moment because as I was working on finding out more about the monuments men and, and, uh, uh, suddenly, you know, a book appeared, uh, and then, um, you know, more and more articles appeared and there, uh, a, a philanthropist in Dallas, uh, who also, he, he's the author of the, of that book, the monuments men, he created a foundation and he, you know, did all this research on who was still living. And, uh, so this all sort of aligned with my writing the book. Um, and then one day my husband emailed me, uh, an article from the Huffington Post that said George Clooney had bought the rights to the Monuments Men book. And that's when I thought, okay, here we go. <laughs> My goodness, what a, what a great convergence of thinking. It's funny how sometimes it does feel as if a, an idea just has its moment, doesn't it? Yes, it, it really does. And uh, so I, so the fact that my book came out three weeks before the movie was, uh, you know, that was a real, uh, I was very pleased with that because I was able to let George Clooney do some of my book marketing for me, which was, <laughs> I was very helpful. <laughs> and you didn't even have to pay him. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't have to pay him at all. Yes. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's great. And the other one we we haven't mentioned, but I think it's actually a better movie, was Is It the Woman in Gold? Yes, yes, which was about um, the restoration of the painting by uh, Klimt to the rightful owners uh, of family that um, – a Viennese family uh, whose descendants now live in America. Um, and I, I felt that movie was a better um, – it, it did a better job of – explaining why it matters that uh, this art be properly restituted. Uh, and it was something that the Nazis totally understood, which is why they stole it in the first place. Um, you know, the significance of these artworks uh, to families um, and to their sort of collective identity and memory. Um, and uh, so I, I felt that that movie did a much better job of kind of tugging at, at those emotions with the Monuments Men film didn't quite hit that mark, I felt. Yeah, I found the one thing that I felt the most shocking, almost the most shocking about the whole thing, of, you know, the, the, doing it in the beginning was shocking, but it did appear that they did have a deliberate policy of destruction when they realised they were going to lose the war. And I just felt such outrage at the thought, not only did they almost... Um, covet these works, but they were wanting to destroy them so no one else would ever be able to see them again. And that seemed particularly vicious. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's sort of that abuser mentality, right? That if, if I can't have you, no one can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's quite shocking, but it's also very effective. Uh, you know, if they had succeeded, it would have been devastating. Um, and luckily there were some, uh, art historians and museum directors in the United States, uh, you know, in the middle of the war who realized that, uh, you know, this was a real danger and they uh, petitioned um, the government and the president to form this, uh, this unit. Um, so thankfully uh, they recognized that whether it was out of completely altruistic uh, motives is not unclear. Certainly American museums benefited from um you know, this displaced art. Uh, but certainly, you know, the idea of saving it is a, is a noble one. And the Monuments Men themselves individually were very much committed to that idea. Yes, yeah. So we've established that you loved writing and that you decided on historical mystery quite early. But um, can you tell us why you decided to do something set in post-war Germany rather than um, a similar, more co contemporary romance. Yes, well, so the the premise of the two books, the character of Anna Klein and her daughter Amalia, uh, who are displaced at the end of the war, is based on the circumstances of my own grandmother and mother. Uh, my mother was five years old at the end of the war, and they were both displaced and separated from my grandfather, who ended up in what became East Germany. He was in the Russian sector uh, right after the war. And my grandmother had to rebuild uh, their lives. And the, the thing that saved her was that she spoke English and she was able to get a job working for an American colonel. And so that was a story that I always um, was interested in. It's not one that she willingly talked about. So I only had little snippets um, of 
what her experience was. And unfortunately, she passed away before I could get really serious about telling her story. But that always was in the back of my mind that that was there was a story there. And then when I learned about the Monuments Men and got really interested in learning more about them, as I said, uh, one day those two ideas just converged. And, um, you know, Anna Klein got a job working with the Monuments Men. And uh, that became the premise uh, for the book. And the Monuments Men became the, you know, the vehicle for telling her story um, and her experience in Germany right after the war. And that all that time has always fascinated me uh, because, you know, the country was absolutely reduced to rubble. And the idea of, you know, how do you rebuild from that uh, into the Germany that I knew growing up uh, was always so fascinating. So I, oh, that was always lingering in my mind. If I was going to write a story that was, you know, it was going to be something to do with that. Yes. Yeah. Tell me, did your grandfather manage to get out of East Germany? He did, uh, but not until much later. I think until the the late 1950s, he uh, walked across the border with just the clothes on his back. Um, But by that point, um, because their future had been so uncertain, um, he and my, he had divorced my grandmother and she had remarried. Uh, so I did grow up with him. He was my grandfather. I knew him, uh, but they were not together after the war. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I thought it was a brave call to make your heroine a German when you're writing for an American audience, just because sometimes those of us outside of America do tend to regard American readers as maybe a little parochial, preferring their own homegrown heroes. So tell us a bit about that decision. Well, uh, that's actually, that's a very good uh, point. Uh, You know, as I said, the story was always in my mind. And, um, and I, you know, I am, uh, I, I grew up in Germany, and I moved to America when I was six. And for me, I've always straddled those two, like, I, I'm not fully American. I'm not fully German. Uh, my father is Turkish. I'm not fully Turkish. I'm not fully, I don't feel fully anything. Uh, and so that the relationship between Anna and Captain Cooper in the book is, it kind of explores that same gap, um, that I experience in my life. She's German, he's American. They have completely different experiences. So I, I kind of approached it from that way. It's like, how do the Germans at this point in history see the Americans and how do the Americans see the Germans? And so, um, that to me, you know, it creates a tension between the characters and, um, that I find really interesting to explore because they kind of both want the same thing, but kind of not really, uh, and they don't really know for sure, um, you know, what, what they're doing. So that, that's interesting. But the thing that, um, I hear most consistently from American readers is that they had not thought about the experience of German civilians in the war, because then, like, as you say, the narrative is, is very much, um, you know, I mean, there is a, there is a very strong, you know, Americans, uh, you know, the allies won world war two and, uh, you know, they defeated the Nazis and that's the narrative. And there isn't much, uh, written about the experience of German civilians in, in fiction. I mean, there's a lot of, I read a ton of books, um, but, uh, you know, it, it, not a lot of fiction in America. And that is the response that I get from readers the most is that that is the part that they never thought about before. That's great. And certainly just harking back to the monuments men for a moment, I think that's one of the weaknesses of the movie from a general viewer point of view, that it is a weenie bit like a sort of triumphant procession of these folks across a, a, a totally destroyed environment. Um, has the series been published in German? It has not. I have uh, quite a few German readers, um, and but I, it has not been published in German or in Germany. Uh huh. Would you Would you think that it? I wish it would be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think should should be an interesting thing to see what their response would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now the roses underneath has won awards, including an indie publisher gold award in 2015. Um, you did indie publish, obviously, to have won that award. Did that feel like vindication for having taken that track yourself? Oh, yes, absolutely, for sure. Um, 
you know, the reason that I chose indie publishing is because because of that movie, because of the Monuments Men movie, um, because I was closely tracking production on that movie because I, you know, I thought I've been working on this book for three, four years and I didn't want the, you know, I did not want the book to appear to be like, oh, I too have a Monuments Men idea. You know, I really, I had been working on it for so long that um, I felt strongly that I wanted it to come out before the movie. And um, as a result, that just the production schedule when it, it got abruptly moved up by a year and that kind of forced my hand in terms of going for indie publishing um, so that I could control when it came out. And so the fact that it came out three weeks before the movie was my great, my great triumph. <laughs> sure. If you'd been in traditional publishing, you might still be waiting. <laughs> yes, exactly. I was at that point in the process of um, querying and I was getting some interests and, you know, but it's a very slow process. And I thought, you know, when they moved up the release date, I thought, boy, if I get an aid, you know, if I get an agent today, uh, I, I, the book still won't come out until maybe a year, a year and a half after the movie. And I thought, well, I don't want to wait that long. So, um, that, that was, uh, that was the choice. So I, I quit querying and I hired an editor and I just went about the business of publishing it myself. So. Great. Yeah. And, and so publishing a book like that three weeks before the movie, was it like almost getting on the crest of an amazing Hawaiian wave? I mean, how did it affect your sales and your visibility, do you think? Well, I, uh, the, the story I always tell is that, you know, I'd been working on the book for so long and I would, you know, in idle conversation with someone in a yoga class or something, they would say, oh, you're working on a book. What is it about? And I would say, well, have you heard of the Monuments Men? And they would say no. And then I would explain. And then all of a sudden, about halfway through 2013, I said that and people started saying, oh, yes, I've heard of the Monuments Men. There's that movie coming out because there had been previews already, you know, and there was some rumblings because it was a George Clooney movie. It was a big deal. So um, that was when I knew, OK, this this is good because it, it's, uh, you know, it's doing some work for me. And I did uh, uh, get to ride that crest. And there was one day um, after uh, sometime, you know, maybe four or five days after the book was published that uh I had an article on Huffington Post, I think. Um, and that one particular day, if you Googled Monuments Men, my Huffington Post article showed up before the above the George Clooney movie. <laughs> I have a screenshot of that. I was like, yes, this is my my one moment. I'm outshining him. <laughs> that must have been terrific. I actually had not really thought when I started reading the book that there would have been such a close alignment. So that, that is terrific. Oh, it became a little bit of an obsession. I think it became a little unhealthy and a little unbalanced. But, uh, you know, I was I was quite a bit disappointed when I saw the movie. You know, I was there the first day it opened and I just thought, oh, no. So but it does, you know, uh, people did hear about it and people did go see it. And um, it did raise awareness about the Monuments Men. So I, I, I know for sure that it helped uh, get the word out about the book as well. Sure, sure. Perhaps turning away from your specific books to talking a little more wi more widely about your career, is there one thing you've done more than any other that's been the secret to your success? And I guess maybe you've already answered that question, getting something published three weeks before a blockbuster Hollywood movie. But <laughs> apart from that. Um, you know, you know, the only secret I can think of, and, and it's so boring and, and, and cliche, is just absolutely sticking with it and persisting and not giving up and getting up every morning and writing when you don't feel like it, uh, you know, just getting the words down. And, um, that has been, I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm, uh, my day job is also as a writer and I get paid, you know, I have clients who pay me to write. And so I have to write when I don't feel like it. And, um, so that created a discipline. I think that was very beneficial, um, for writing a novel that, especially that first novel that absolutely no one except you cares about. Uh, and, um, you know, you have to create your own sort of momentum and, uh, uh, drive to get it to get it going. But that's, I mean, it's just writing every day. Uh, doesn't have to be fiction, but just, you know, um, sitting there with, you know, and just typing away, uh, 
whether you want to or not, that that's the only thing I can think of that has gotten me to where I am. And that might be also one of the straight benefits of having done your previous job. I was going to ask you how being in publishing and magazines had helped with your writing. Apart from that obvious discipline, is there anything else? You still are doing it, obviously. Yes, I mean, I would actually say being in publishing, what where that really helped is with the, you know, with the with the indie publishing is is, uh, you know, for me, I having worked in both magazines and books, I know what it takes to get a written, you know, the written word published on a page. Uh, so that none of that process was a mystery to me, and I, I, um, it was kind of fun to, you know, do it for your own book. Um, so that definitely helped, uh, you know, and I had contacts, you know, I had someone who could design the cover and I can do the layout and I had, uh, proofreaders and I had, you know, I found an editor and, and I know how all that works and what the steps are and why you have to go through those steps. So that was, that was very helpful. Um, and one of the, in terms of writing, it was, uh, you know, the first two drafts, I think I sent, maybe the second draft of like the first five chapters to a friend of mine in New York and uh, who works in publishing. And, and he sent it back and he said, you know, this is, this is good, but you know, you, you can make stuff up. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, right. Okay. Cause I, I, you know, I had so, I was so not used to writing fiction. I was, I'm used to writing about, you know, uh, what I see if I'm, if I'm writing about architecture, if I'm writing about buildings, I can't just make stuff up. So that um, it took me a couple of, of drafts uh, to get to loosen up in that way. Uh, and then once I figured that out, I really had a good time. So um, it, it, they are very different um, kinds of writing, but uh, I think they complement each other in terms of skills. You know, uh, they feed off each other. Yeah, yeah. And obviously it sounds like you did a lot of on the ground research in um, Germany as well. If you were going to organize a literary magical mystery tour for the Anna Klein series, where would you trip advise people to go? <laughs> well, this is a really, uh, this is a great question because I just had an exchange with an art historian on, on Twitter who um, read, she is based uh, in, I believe in, she's based in London, I believe. And um, but she had read the book uh, and she specializes in German art. Uh, she had read the book and was traveling to Wiesbaden, uh, which is where the book is set. Um, and uh, she did her own little uh, Anna Klein tour around the town. Uh, so, um, you know, definitely I went to Wiesbaden when I was uh, working on the book. Uh, so um, the places that appear in the novel, uh, you know, that they are the kind of tourist highlights of Wiesbaden. Uh, but of course, it's 1945 in the book and they're, um, you know, partially destroyed or completely obliterated. But, you know, the the art museum uh, in Wiesbaden, um, there's a very famous spa there. There's a very famous hotel that all of those appear in the book. Um, there's a Russian chapel up on top of the hill uh, that Anna and Cooper go visit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it kind of hits all, all of the big points of Wiesbaden. And I was so delighted to hear from this woman who, you know, walked through the town and went to the museum where most of the book is set because that is where the Monuments Men collecting point was. Um, and, uh, you know, she said, oh, I walked through the back door where Anna walks in. And I thought, oh, that's I, it's so amazing to have a character come to life like that. Uh, in, in a complete stranger's uh, mind, uh, and to make that connection, I just supposed I was so thrilled. So I would I would say you know go to Wiesbaden and walk around the old town, and and people will recognize places from the book. Oh, that's fabulous! It is wonderful to have that sort of connection with readers, isn't it? That I mean, Twitter I think is has been so fantastic. I've also connected with a. Um, art historian in Wiesbaden who wrote her PhD on the work of the monuments at the Wiesbaden Collecting Point, and she was a tremendous resource for the for the second book. Um, she uh, very generously shared her dissertation with me and um, uh, reviewed the draft just to make sure that you know what I was saying was at least plausible and not completely, you know, uh, 
ridiculous. So um, I've certainly connected with some fantastic people on Twitter. It's been it's been really great. I mean, Twitter has a bad reputation for a good reason, but there's also really some really great people there. That's wonderful. Now, perhaps turning to see if, as a reader, this podcast is called The Joys of Binge Reading, and we try and interview series readers because these days lots of people like to get into a series. Have you ever in the past been a binge reader? And if so, who were your favorites? Oh, I I am. Uh, I'm not as much now. Uh, sort of when you take up writing, you actually uh, have less time for binge reading. But there are certainly authors who write series. I mean, the first the first series I can ever remember binge reading where I literally put down one book and picked up the next one was Patricia Cornwell. And I just I just was buried in her in that world that she created. And that was definitely an inspiration for writing as well. You know, the characters that she created and this like specific knowledge that her characters have. I found it really fascinating. Um, There's um, I mean, Sue Grafton was another one that I, I picked up one, you know, I would finish one and pick up the next one. I just really enjoyed her books. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I loved her as a writer, as a person, um, you know, at her book signings, she was always, she, the, I went to one, but, uh, at her book signings and in interviews, she was so sort of joyful and loved being a writer. And she was another, um, inspiration for me, not just in terms of, um, uh, you know, being a reader, but becoming a writer as well. Um, and then, I mean, my absolute favorite, uh, it's not really a bin. I can't really binge read because he's still writing. And but I, you know, as soon as his books come out, I drop everything and read the next one. Is um, Philip Kerr who writes the Bernie Gunther series um, about a detective who uh, gets up to all kinds of um, mysteries and shenanigans spanning from about nineteen. 19- 30 to 1950. Uh, and he, and it includes world war two and the aftermath and the lead up to the war. He, he jumps around. Um, so that's, a, that's another one. Um, one of my absolute favorites, um, that, yeah, Jacqueline Winspear, the Maisie Dobbs series is another one I really enjoy. Mm, I think that's all I can think of right they, now. They sound great. Actually, they're all on my list to either read or get or look at. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So see, if circling back from the beginning to where we are now, at this stage in your career, if you were doing it all again, is there anything that you would change or are you pretty happy with the way it's going? Uh, the only thing I would change is I would have started earlier. I would have, I would have, uh, trusted my, uh, abilities sooner. I mean, I don't know if, this could only have happened this way, um, you know, after having, uh, achieved a certain age and, and work experience and life experience and confidence. I don't know if that is such a, you know, critical part of this, that it, that you can't do it over without that. But that's, that's the only thing I would change is I would have started sooner in my life. You know, it's so interesting. I'd say that probably more than 50% of the writers who answer that question say exactly the same thing. Really? They wish they'd started earlier. It's, it's probably, yeah, and it's debatable whether you really, whether there's a time where it just all comes together or whether we really could make that difference if we'd, if we'd thought about it. It's, it's probably the, the subject of a blog post sometime, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's interesting to think about it. it you know, I don't know if it could have happened sooner, uh, honestly, because one of the things it, in my book is that Anna is a mother, and it was really becoming a mother for me that raised all of these kinds of questions that she deals with. And I would think about, you know, well, what would I do in this situation um, as a mother? And that I don't think I could have written that without. Um, you know, being a mother myself, I'm not, you know, just for myself, I'm sure people can do it. I don't think I could. Um, so that was kind of a critical element for me. Yes, I think sometimes too, if, if you're developing these family sagas, having that experience of building your own family, being married, having children, suddenly makes you much more appreciative of the previous generation and what they face, doesn't it? Yes, exactly. Yes, it gives you a whole new perspective, you know. And what I remember... 
when I became a mother, how suddenly I would watch movies and I would totally relate to the mother character. Whereas before I never, I, I was not relating to that character. I would relate to the daughter character or, you know, the friend or something. But once I, you know, had my daughter, suddenly everything was from the mother's perspective. And <laughs> that was, that was definitely yeah, new. Yeah. So what is next for CF the writer? You've got book three in, in, in development. Yes. So the, the, I always, when I wrote the first one, when I wrote the roses underneath, it occurred to me that there would be three books in this series. There are three, each book is, um, revolves around a particular historic event. And when I was doing my research, there were three events that I thought I could, uh, you know, kind of anchor a story around. So there's one more, uh, to come, uh, and, uh, you know, for me, it's interesting, you know, this time of 1945 is really interesting because everything is so in chaos and, um, uh, you know, the world is destroyed. So after about, you know, 1946, you know, things start to settle down and certainly the work of the Monuments Men becomes quite bureaucratic. And it's not, for me, it's not as, uh, as rich, um, a ground to, you know, to, to mine for stories. So there's one more, uh, in this series and yes, that's what I'm working on. And what, what year does that take us through to? Well, it actually only takes us through early 1946 because, um, uh, you know, like I said, it, it, it was this real crucible of time where they had to figure out what to do with all this art and, 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 you know, they didn't have security and they didn't have the way to properly store it. And, you know, all these kind of challenges swirled around the work they were doing. And once those things got solved, it becomes less interesting, uh, for me as a writer. So, and I deliberately, um, set the, you know, the first book, uh, is in about August of 1945. And the second one is in about November. Um, so the, the second one really picks up almost immediately um, after the first one. And then the third one will, will, you know, it starts somewhere around January and will end in probably February. So it's a very short amount of time for the three books, but I did that on purpose to kind of keep it in this moment, this very particular moment. And when do you hope to have that one published? Well, that's a <laughs> that's a very good question. I'm I'm going to, I'm aiming for next year. So, um, uh, but I don't know yet when. So, it I mean that's one of the one of the joys of self publishing is that you know it it will be ready when it's ready. But of course, uh, I don't want to keep people waiting too long. Sure, sure. So we're coming to an end. Where can readers find you online? Well, I have a, a website that's uh, cfyetman.com, uh, and uh, I am on Twitter and on Facebook with uh, both of those uh, those same handles, CF Yetman. So, uh, and I'm quite active on Twitter, um, uh, not as uh, active on Facebook as my assistant says I should be. So, I'm going to try to do better. Uh, but yes, I would absolutely love to see people online. I, I I'm there quite a bit. That's lovely. Well, it's been a joy talking to you. It really has. It's been a fascinating story to hear about this series and we'll be holding our breath for book three. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your interest. It's been a real pleasure talking with you as well. Thanks, Siev. Have a great day. Okay, thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Hey. Thanks for listening to the Joys of Binge Reading podcast. You can find all the details and links for this episode at www.thejoysofbingereading.com. We'd love to hear your comments and suggestions for who you'd like us to interview next. And if you enjoyed the show, take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or a similar provider so you won't miss out on future guests. Thanks for joining us and happy reading. The Joys of Binge Reading podcast is put together with fantastic technical help from Dan Cotton and Abe Raffles. Dan is an experienced sound and video engineer who's ready and available to help you with your next project. Seek him out at dcaudioservices at gmail.com. That's D for Daniel, C for Charlie, audioservices at gmail.com. Or check our show notes. He's fast, he takes pride in getting it right, and he's great to work with. Our voiceovers are done by Abe Raffles, another gem of sound and screen. 
Abe has 20 years of experience on both sides of the camera slash microphone. As a cameraman director and also as a voice artist and TV presenter. I think you'd agree that his voice is both light-hearted and warm. He is super easy to work with no matter what the job. You'll find him at Abe, A-B-E, at pointandshoot.co.nz. As I say, the full details in the show notes on the website. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Hopefully see you next week. Bye.